you have to let go of all the things that hold you back and just say, I'm going to fix my mental health by any means necessary. And so if that means I have to pack up everything I own under the back of the Toyota Camry, drive across the damn country and go to a therapist with what little bit of money that I have, then motherfucker, let's ride. Welcome back to Off the Cuff. I am your host, Daniel Priori, and today I am joined by an entrepreneur, a best-selling author, a coach, speaker, advocate for survivors of childhood trauma. He goes by the name of Michael Unbroken. Michael, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Yeah, my guy, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Thanks for the time. Absolutely, absolutely. First of all, I got to say, studio looks dope. Thank you, thank you. You know, while I was reading uh, the notes for for the episode, biracial Mormon, right? When you were a kid, right? What was that like? Uh, exactly how you think it would probably be. <laughs> Pretty wild, man. You know, it's um, you don't know what you don't know, right? And right. growing up in that scenario. So I think you got to also add the caveat of while also having a mother who's a drug addict and alcoholic and a stepfather who's abusive and being homeless and also being biracial and being Mormon. It's, you know, life was very odd. And, and it's interesting because people be like, that's a crazy story. And I'm like, it's not a story. Like it's fact. It's my life. It's what I've been through and what I've experienced. And I, I think the thing that I always try to remember is you know, everyone's journey is different. We all have a different life. We all have a different experience. We all come from different backgrounds. And I tried really hard to preface it up front and remind people to not be comparative um, because it is interesting and it's a weird thing to kind of jump off with, but it's a, it's a part of my life. And so what was it like? I mean, it was exactly like what you would think it would be. I mean, what's it like for anyone growing up anywhere until they realize maybe something is weird or different or wrong. Mm. And you know, when, when I was 12 years old, I made a decision to forever leave the church because I was like, this is nonsense. I mean, there's a passage in the Book of Mormon, those with a dark skin will not be allowed through the gates of heaven. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. Well, that tells me everything that I need to know. And going through that process was a literal war with my family. And, and it was something that even to this day, I'd do not step foot inside of churches. I am spiritual in my own way, but ultimately the, the biggest thing I always think about is, you know, those times and those moments, as much as they suck, they shape you, they create who you are. And so I always try not to be dismissive of those experiences right. and instead just be like, yep, that happened. So, you know, all this time, right? So you were Mormon from the time you were born and you're, you know, you're saying that, you know, uh, you have an abusive stepfather um, and a drug addicted mom. When you were looking for help in those situations, did you turn to the church at all during during those times? Because when you're a kid, you really only know like what, like you said, like what your family tells you, and uh, and and you know what your like what people around you tell you. So at that time, were you like, I don't even know where to go. I'm going to try to go to the Mormon church and try and get help. No, because I mean, you know, here's the thing. One of the really fascinating things that happened in that that window of time. So between like eight to 12 years old, um, we were super poor. I mean, we were ah. deeply impoverished. We were, we were homeless for periods of time. And a lot of the, a lot of the like tithings of the church would go towards helping my family, right? We would wow. get food from the pantry. We'd get clothes from the donations. They would pay our rent sometimes like, you know, and so one of the things my, my mother made abundantly clear, she was like, you never talk about what happens in this house at church. And that's because like, dude, honestly, she was just gaming the system. Like she had figured out how to manipulate people into giving her what she wanted. And because of that, it gave her the ability to be able to, you know, have them pay for our food and our clothes and our electricity and our rent while she was spending all her money on drugs and alcohol. Mm. So it was really solidified. Like, don't you ever talk about this outside of this house? And, you know, it was wild because, you know, even before church, our stepdad would just beat the crap out of us or our mom would belittle us. And then it's like, we're in church and a happy family. 
one of the really fascinating things during that time period is when we were getting bounced around place to place to place, I started to realize like not all families were like mine. And so we would be sometimes in church and next thing you know, we're spending the night with this family or that family or that, you know, deacon or that mission or like whatever it was. And I started to realize like, whoa, what's happening in my house is vastly different than what's happening in most people's homes. Not that that didn't happen too. not that, because trust me, man, I saw some massive abuse from the families in the Mormon church, but I also saw some beautiful, caring people and seeing those beautiful, caring people made me start to understand like, oh, wait a second, this shit at my house is not actually the norm. And there's yeah. something different here. Something going, something going uh, drastically wrong in, in your household. So, you know, for you, I always say, um, you know, uh, my sister, um, my youngest sister is adopted and she came from uh, a mother who neglected her, abused her, um, used to leave her in the in the high chair for like days on end, like old diapers, stuff like that. And it's, you know, and I think stuff like that really stuck with my sister still to this day. It's still it still sticks. Um, you know how they say like children can learn languages faster. I also think children, uh, the way they absorb trauma is a lot different than adults, um, o o almost easier and almost faster. And uh, it, it leaves a, a longer lasting impression when it comes to your Absolutely. stepfather. Uh, where was your biological father? Don't know. Never met him. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, now, as a kid, did you ever ask your mom about him? Like, hey, like, you know, I want to know. Or was it one of those things like, nah, he didn't show up. So fuck him. I don't even want to talk to him. Yeah. You know, what? it was interesting because my grandmother knew where he was. And so sometimes I would hear like these phone calls she would be having with him. And so one thing's, you know, growing, being biracial, my grandma is an old racist ass white lady from a town in Tennessee you have never heard of. And so wow. I would hear her just the racial epitaphs and the words she would use talking to, I assume, his family or, you know, him. I don't know if it was ever him, but I know for sure it was his family sometimes. And so it was very much laid in stone early on, like this person's not a part of our life because he chooses not to be. Mm. And you know, what's really interesting is I knew that once I started to have some fame in the world, and I always thought I'd like in, in certain circles, people know who I am. Right. And mm -hmm. especially in personal development, and especially in the trauma conversation, I remember being a little kid and I was like, when I'm famous, I know that one day someone out of the woodwork is going to be like, I know where your dad is. And so that mm -hmm. actually happened last summer. And I remember I knew it was coming. I'd been preparing my whole life for that moment, 37 yeah. years old. And I go, oh, okay, cool. Well, I knew this was going to happen, but I don't want to have anything to do with this, right? I'm not a hard person to find. Come to find out he was still living in the same state as us. And, you know, I just thought to myself, I don't want to be in connection with people who don't want to be in connection with me. And so some people will find it necessary to go and seek that person, their biological parents, their mother, their brother, whomever. And I'm just like, nah, I'm good. They don't want me. So, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to live my life to the fullest and be the person that I want to be. And, you know, I, I wouldn't be here if he would have been in my life. You know, I yeah. would not be helping hundreds of thousands of people around the world and have a best selling book and be one of the most renowned speakers in the country if he probably would have been in my life and we wouldn't be able to help people uh, or have this conversation. And so, you know, while most people are like, oh, it must be so terrible not to have a dad, I'm like, well, you don't know what you don't know. You know, uh, my, my, my sister who's adopted, uh, she felt that way too. Um, I remember my mom asking her multiple times, like, well, you know, if you want to meet your biological mom, she was like, why you're my mom. Yeah. You know, the, 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 this, this person didn't want to take care of me. Um, so, so was your stepfather around at what age, what, what age did your stepfather come into the, come into the picture? Yeah, just one day he just like showed up, you know, and I, I'll never forget like the day he married my mom, he put my me and my two brothers together and he was like, is it cool if I marry your mom? And I'm like six. I'm like, I don't know what that means. And I have no idea who you are, but okay. 
Um, and then, you know, from there, it was just this crazy 180, like it, things just got massively, massively worse. And, you know, it is one of the, where I look back on it and I, I think about those experiences, you know, I'm, I'm six, four, 220 pounds. I'm a pretty built guy could be a linebacker. Right. <laughs> and, and I remember my stepfather was probably about my size or a little bit smaller when I was a kid. And so, you know, you think about somebody that size beating up children, oh, right. Geez. Literally beating up children and locking us in closets, slamming our heads in while doing all these very, very awful things. And, you know, I, I sat one day and I had this recollection or this experience recollections are all learned. I had this moment of reconciliation where I was like, oh, I get it actually, which is a real like crazy thing to say. Like, how can you get a grown up beating up a child? And that's because I look at who his stepmother was or his mother was my step grandma. And she was arguably, and I hate to say it, but it's just true. The worst person I've ever known in my life. Oof. And, you know, you look at that and you go, oh, okay, Jeez. this is what generational trauma is. So how did she get that way? Well, let's look at her parents. And then what happened right before that? Oh, we're talking about slave trade. Okay, cool. And what we're talking about before that. And this thing just goes on and on and on and on and on. And then, you know, I look at myself, I look at my brothers, I look at people who are now changing the world, right? Who have said, I'm going to end this cycle because we don't want to be them. We don't want to be our parents. We don't want to be our step parents. We don't want to be these people who have just really never done the work. There are these damaged, hurt, broken people because they did not make a decision to learn to love themselves. People act out violently because they don't know how to communicate because they're ignorant. Yes. And I don't mean ignorant, like stupid. I mean, ignorant of truth. They don't know how to like actually be a human being because it's stripped from you, right? Through the own abuse that you have through the experiences that they have in childhood. And that's the thing that people have to remember is, you know, it'd be really easy for me to sit here and defame, you know, my mother and my stepfather, my grandmother, my community, my teachers, my peers growing up, but have just come to realize they're ignorant. Mm. And, and for me, education is everything. And when I say that, I mean it literally, I've spent more time, effort, energy, and money on my own personal development and knowledge and education around trauma, the impact of trauma, mindset, personal development, entrepreneurship, business, being a speaker, being an author, hosting a podcast, doing all these things. And so because of that education, because of my willingness to heal, I am no longer ignorant because I can promise you, I, you go look at me 25 years and younger, my life was chaos, like yeah. craziness. For sure. And so I, I look at those people and I go, yep, I get it. I don't want to be that. So what do I have to do? So, you know, um, so you got introduced to therapy, you know, before I go into that question, I, I really do feel like, um, you know, when I talk to people on this show, I never want it to just be like, oh, yeah, let's just have like this back and forth. And, you know, I'll ask you some questions. Uh, just, just something just from when I was reading your biography and your info, it's just I, I, I hope, you know, and I hope that you take the time to realize how strong of a person you are. I mean, I could tell it in, in your demeanor that you that you are strong, but. You know, when when I read some of the bios of people that come on this show, I get I get I get moved to almost being emotional. And, um, you know, when, when I was reading yours, it's something that, you know, about you, you being molested by someone from the church as a young kid. You got you have a, a drug addicted mom. You have a abusive stepfather you're you're biracial in 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 a racist church um and for me i'm i'm looking at it from a sense of there's so many of you which is which is the sad the saddest part of it and that's and that's one of the things that sticks with me the most is that what i go through and what i've been through in my life millions of other people have been through um and and like you said it, it it's about it's about breaking the cycle you know what I mean? And uh, I hope that you take the time to to uh, think about where you came from and how far and how long of a trip it's been. And, uh, you know, give yourself a, a 
a self-deserved pat on the back to to understand how far you've come because statistically you're not supposed to be here. Yeah. Well, and I appreciate that. And yeah, every single day. And, you know, the way that I do that is by continuing to live into the potential that I know I have. And it is, I mean, it's crazy common, you know, I I've coached thousands of people. I mean, we have our, our conference coming up in December. We got thousands of people registered for that. And it's like, this impacts everybody. And so for me, my, my concept and idea of pride comes in, you know, if I can help people navigate what I've been through, that means all that stuff has a purpose because before that it was drugs and alcohol and sex and rock and roll and all those things. Yeah, yeah. Right. And it was like this crazy lifestyle until I realized the the greatest truth of life. And that is that we are to be of service by helping people do what we've been able to do in our life. And, and I think, I think exactly what you said though, in that moment is that we do have to be in service to other people. Um, human beings are not meant to be alone. Uh, totally. You know, um, we, we've been, we've been pack animals, tribe based, uh, um, you know, existence since the beginning of time. Right. Um, and it's almost like I, I always, I, I want to get your input on this, like, especially do with like mental health. Now, do you feel like mental health is almost being oversaturated in a sense of like how it's being presented either online or being presented either on, you know, um, you know, within influencers and stuff like I've, it's almost like people are into mental health because it's sexy now, but not for yeah. the, not for the actual mission. Yeah. Well, look, and I am an influencer in mental health, right? Me and too, I, yeah. I, I think about this every day and there's, there's this big curve curve that has happened where, you know, it's a bell curve and eventually everything evens out. In the same way that you see people who are crying on the internet, I'm like, okay, what function form service does that provide for people other than being self-masturbatory, right? Yes. Like, how does that help people? How does that benefit people? And then on the other side, you have people who are leaders, who are change makers, who are showing up, who are executing, who are teaching, who are instructing, who are leading by example. And so, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, look, it's just like the reticular activating system. Like you will find whatever you are, the reticular activating system, you will find what you're looking for. And so if you want to find bullshit mental health, it's going to be there for you. If yeah. you want to find powerful and practical mental health, it'll be there for you too. And I think that like anything, it's just, we have course corrected overly to a point that it's become almost a fad right? To, yes. to have these conversations. But look, dude, here's what's really interesting. When I started thinking broken six years ago, nobody was talking about this stuff. True. Right. Nobody was having these conversations. And so I kind of led the charge and in leading the charge, one of the things that I just noticed, I was like, oh, they're doing it and they're doing it. Cause like, literally I can go rewind to two people that I could find in the space doing what I'm doing. And now you find a ton of people and then some of those people are full of shit and some of them aren't. And yeah. I think that that's just the nature of it all. And so, you know, I'd rather be having the conversation at scale than not having it at all. True. It's like, it, it, it almost helps. Um, it helps in a way, you know, if you're scrolling through Instagram or YouTube shorts or whatever fucking app you're on and you're just going through all this shit and, and, you know, and you do see it, listen, if that propels you to, you know, maybe finding someone like yourself, um you know what i mean it's 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 tough because like sometimes it's like i didn't go through that uh 5150 for nothing you know what i mean right so it, yeah. it, it it's one of those things like it's uh it's almost like we're prideful over uh over our experiences instead of being uh shameful about what we went through so i i think that's like you know it's something about the transparency of somebody like you that really affects people's lives. And yeah, um, and look, and, and I have clarity about what I'm doing also. Like, let's let's not ever get this twisted. Think Unbroken is a business, right? And right. and the reason why is because I, I know a truth about myself and the human experience. People who pay, pay attention. Mm -hmm. And so when I spent all those years 
bullshitting my life away, never investing in myself. I knew that if I, and look, we've made 500 episodes of a podcast. I've been a guest four or 500 other times. There's free books and free content and free this and free that. I mean, I have so much free stuff out on the internet. It's not even remotely funny. But I also know that the people who come into the paid programs, those are the people who have the most success, point blank, period. Right. And the one thing that I know about this idea about honoring and holding the truth of your story is there are certain things that publicly I will never talk about. Right. And, and the reason why is because they're so dark, they don't help people. And what a lot of folks do is they dump their whole world onto the internet and they're like, I'm helping. And it's like, you're actually not what you're mm -hmm. doing is you're forgetting that you are talking about a wound that has not scarred over. And you're expecting that the world is going to relate to you about that. And there are things in my own life, like Speaking of my my step grandmother, I will never ever 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 share some of the things that I witnessed being in her presence because they do not help humanity. And a lot of people will share things that they think are for the betterment of people by having a conversation, not recognizing and understanding that actually what they're doing is they are leaving this big gap in the world that then has to be filled by someone else because you've introduced or reintroduced trauma to people. And so I'm very clear and concise about what I talk about. And the reason why is because I've done my work, bro. I've been to all the therapy. I've been to all the coaching. I've been to all the seminars. I've read all the books for 12 years. This has been my life. And so when I see people who are posting things for the sake of posting for the reasons of likes and hits, like, dude, sometimes we post stuff and I get one like, I'm like, I don't give a shit. And sometimes oh, yeah. 40,000 views and I'm like, who cares? And then what happens is what I'm focused on are the people who reach out and they're like, Hey, this thing that you did helped me. And that's what I think about. And sitting on the internet, not being, let me phrase that being on social media and not having clarity about your mission and just ad nauseum vomiting your experience on people does not help. Man. I don't think I, I don't think I could put it any better myself. I mean, it, it's the thing is, you know, I think that we have to be protective about some things in our life, not just for us, but for other people, like just, just exactly like you said. I mean, you know, there's experiences that I've had in my life that I don't think for, for the greater good are, are supposed to be out there either. Um, you know, and it, it's one of those things that, I want to go back to what you said too. It's mental health is a business. It it it, it is a business. So well, everything you, is. Everything is. Everything is a business. Um, and I think that if you're, you know, if you're good at something and you're helping people, people have to make a living regardless. So I, I think people look at when people are trying to make money or or make a lifestyle off of talking about mental health, automatically they think, oh, this person's uh, a fraud or this person's this or this person's that. Yeah, then why is Tony billion, Tony Robbins worth $7 billion? And this guy has shows where he doesn't even show up and people pay to go. For sure, because he's built it. You know what I mean? It helps because it works. The market will always figure it out, man. There are people, I'm telling you right now, dude, there are people who... Over the years, I have watched them show up and then disappear because oh, yeah. the market decides. And ultimately, if you're not being of service of people, like it's going to, dude, money follows truth. That's all I know. And so if and people spend money because they want the solution, they want the thing. You go, you get a hole in your tire, you go to the tire place because they can fix the damn tire, yeah, right? And I think- the wild thing is people get up in arms. Like I've even gotten messages many, many, many times over the years where people are like, you're stealing from people. And I'm like, am I though? Cause I'm pretty sure I've spent a quarter of a million dollars on my own personal journey and over 6,400 hours of education that I am giving you for a course. That's $96. Are you sure about that? It's, I think a lot of people, it, it almost puts us in a point where like we have to be almost like defensive about what we do for a living. It's like, you know, no, you but don't. 
no, you don't, because here's why. Because the people, I'll tell you exactly, because dude, I'm telling you, I get messages daily from people who are like, that course that I bought saved my life. I'm not defensive about spending nine, charging $97 or $997 or $19,997 because I know the value. I know what it does for people. The reason why people in this space get defensive is because they don't believe in their product and they don't believe in their service and they don't believe in the thing that they've created. I will never apologize for charging people money, especially with tens of thousands of hours of free content on the internet, because I want to make a living too. And I need to support myself and my career and my education and the people who are defensive who will, or even the people who reach out and they'll be like, it's unfair for you to charge money. I'm like, you're right. It is. It is. I would charge you apples if the payment was apples. Mm. But unfortunately, the world don't run on apples. Does not. And if it did, I'd be like, how do I get more apples? For sure. I'd be hoarding fucking apples like crazy. Right. And one of the big things is people have money trauma, man. And I did too. And it took me a long fucking time to heal that because growing Ex up. El el elaborate on, on money trauma. That's kind of that's that's kind of new to me. I want to know what. Yeah. What Look, and not a lot of people recognize it. Right. Every, everything is causation and correlation. Right. Everything is learned behavior. And so growing up, I would watch and witness like the electric company turn off our electricity, the water company turn off our water, the the eviction notice on the door, the I can't eat at school today because we didn't pay for the lunch card, the, the fact that like literally my mom would go take us to get family pictures, keep the tags on the shirt and return the, the shirts at the end of the pictures, right? The bill collectors calling, the repossessions. I witnessed all of that. And so that's what I thought money was about. And so even though in my early, my late teens, I was driven, I said, I want to make a hundred grand a year legally. Right. And I was driven by that. What happened was by the time I'm 26, I've made almost a million dollars working for a fortune 10 company. I have no high school diploma. I have no college education to this day. I have neither of those things. And yet I landed a job with a fortune 10 company. I'm making all this money. And by the time I'm 26, I'm $50,000 in debt. $50,000 in debt. Live, imagine living paycheck to paycheck, making 15 to 20 grand a month. Yeah. Right. Paycheck yeah. to paycheck. My credit cards were out of control. My closet was out of control. I had a hundred thousand dollar car wearing all these expensive clothes and shoes. And it got to the point where I literally had to borrow money. Dude, I had to borrow money from my girlfriend to pay our rent. And she lived with me and I was making $175,000 because I was so tied into the narrative of not having value of not believing I was worthy of it by also repeating behavior patterns that I witnessed and modeled in childhood that led me to this place where even though on paper and the outside world, everything looks great. I'm having panic attacks because my sister's calling me, telling me that the creditor is calling her because I'm not paying the bill. Oh. And I made almost a million dollars. What happens was I recognized at one point, I'm 26, and I saw this ad for a Brendan Burchard course. And so Brendan, I will say, is literally my first mentor. And it was 50 bucks. And I remember being like, how the fuck is this guy going to help me? He doesn't know anything about my life. He's yeah. never been through this. He doesn't know what it's like to live this. And But it was just something told me, man, just like try this. Try it, try it, try it, try it, try it. Do something different. Try to invest in yourself. Yeah. And I looked down at my shoes and I realized I had on a $400 pair of Jordans. And yet I had never spent $5 on my own personal development, my own journey. And I'm already 50 grand in debt. So you know what? I was like, fuck it. What's another 50 bucks? And so I did it. And that turned into $97 to $500 to $1,000 to 5,000 to 10,000 to $25,000 at a time investments in myself. Why? Because most people put more import on the products in their home than they do on their own experience of life. And I was that person. And what was interesting is as I built more confidence, as I built more self-love, as I healed more, I recognized that money be, is like what everybody always says. It's just simply a tool of energy. 
And so I took it. I had clarity about what I wanted. I invested in myself and I moved forward diligently every single day to make sure that I could have the life that I wanted to have. I paid off the debt. I built a business. I built another business. We started to have success. I started making sure I did more and more and more. And as the things went on, I started to really understand one of the interesting realities about money and trauma. Most people are in debt. And the reason that they're in debt is because they don't believe that they're allowed to not be. And it is the same way that most people who are in shit relationships don't believe they're not allowed to be in a non-shitty relationship. It is all a mindset. And the only way you change your mindset about this is you have to build confidence in who you are by doing things differently than you've already done them. And so perfect example, man, this just literally happened on Tuesday. So I love stand-up comedy. Love it. Obsessed. I get a message. Dave Chappelle doing a secret show in Denver, Colorado tonight. I went on the website. I did it fast enough. I got tickets in my cart. And the tickets with fees for two of them were $320. Oof, yeah. And I sat there and I thought about it very, very, very clearly for about four minutes because that was the window before the car yeah, closed yeah. and I had to make a decision. And I asked myself, what do I actually want in my life right now? Well, I want to make Think Unbroken one of the biggest mental health companies on planet Earth. I need money for marketing. Do I go to Dave Chappelle or do I spend $320 to acquire customers? I did not go to Dave Chappelle, mm. even though it's like, I was like, oh my God, dude, I want to go to this so bad. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's like, that's the thing. You build confidence in your skill and your ability, by, especially with money, by doing the opposite. Stop worrying about saving $5 Starbucks to a million bucks. Like, that's nonsense. You're never going to save your way to a million dollars. That's yeah. stupid. You have to build skills that allow you to make more money because skill have utility. The more skill with utility have, the more you can charge in the marketplace. This applies to everything. Literally, you could become the, uh, uh, when I mean everything, like my yeah. first real job, I worked at a Wendy's at 18 years old. I had a 52 people under me. I was in a manager role. Well, Wendy's has store trainers who go store to store to store to store, who train the store on updating on things, on how to properly cook the fries on everything. And I, I remember really looking at that as a possible path of my future. And I understood something at 18 years old. I didn't have the skills to have that job, but that job paid a hundred thousand dollars a year. Right. And how so, do I get there? How do you get there? And most people, what they do is they go, Oh, it's okay. I'll go to Dave Chappelle. I'll put it on the credit card. I'll worry about it later. I think to myself, well, I would rather build my life and then go to Dave Chappelle later. I tell people that all the time. It's like, you know, even for me, it's my level, my level of like financial comfort was never at the point where like, I want to be, I want this big ass crib. I, I want these whips. Like I, I want, you know, there's things, there's things I like, but even like the stuff that I buy that, ex that are expensive now are things that aren't going to depreciate. So it's like, you know, it's a, I, I'm a watch guy. I love watches. I, I only get a watch if it's going to be the same amount. I could sell it for the same amount or sell it for more. If God forbid, I need to. Um, I tell people all the time, though, it's like when you start having moments where it only only depends on you, you do have those those moments of clarity in Best Buy, uh, in, 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 uh, even in like in BJ, in BJ's, I'm like, yo, I could either buy this dope ass blanket. Or I could buy a couple SD cards for my camera. So, you know, there, there, there's there's things that you have to figure out. And then also it's like you have to have 10 hustles. You have to. Like people got to understand it's like until you get to the main one, you have to have the to, until you get to the ultimate hustle, you have to have 10 mini hustles. Yeah. Well, I think you just have to fail a lot. I mean, I have like seven or eight failed businesses. Yeah, right. of course. Everybody, literally everyone I know who's successful does. Tom oh. Bill is my mentor. Tom Bill is a billionaire. He founded and sold Quest Nutrition for a billion dollars. He had like fucking nine failed businesses. Right? You know, and, and so if you true. want to be an if you want to be an entrepreneur, man, that's the game. Like that is the game. And you know, here's the really interesting thing. The the last point I'll make about spending money. 
is when I went back and, and I was thinking about that, that moment of looking at those Jordans and then looking at that $50 course for Brendan Burchard, I understood something. I'd never owned a pair of shoes that made me love myself. Mm. That's true. I do. I do love shoes though. <laughs> I do too. You know, it's, and it's hard sometimes. I just sold like three quarters of my collection for that reason. It's like, yeah, this shit is just sitting here taking up space. And I was like, you know, like, it's just, it's why, you know, and thankfully I got return on my investment, but I really had that moment too. I'm like, I don't need all these fucking shoes, man. This is, this is ridiculous. I'm, I'm compensating for something. Well, no, you're also being marketed to, and people are really smart marketers and they're telling you have to yes. have this. And then you, th then the thing happens is you realize like, actually, I don't need this. I mean, I would, you can ask anybody who knows me, you can fit my whole closet into one suitcase. I I'm wish. a minimalist. I wish. I have nothing. I have nothing because how'd you, you get, how'd you get it. to that point? By giving everything away. Yeah. Because here's what, here's what happened four years ago. I was like, I'm going to go travel the world. So there's a, there's a picture of my grandmother and my passport. Now my relationship with her until she died was always tumultuous period, mm -hmm. but she inspired me in a lot of ways because she raised other people's kids. She really worked her face off. She struggled, but she had her own demons. Right. And one day we're watching, I'm going to answer your question, but I want to tell this story. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. We're, we're watching Anthony Bourdain's um, first travel show chef right. tour. And I, I was sitting there, I'm 12 years old. She's in her rocking chair, smoking a cigarette, playing this video poker game, rocking back and forth, drinking a Pabst Blue Ribbon. I remember it like it was yesterday. And here I am, 12 years old, just chilling in front of this big old wooden RCA TV, about yay big. <laughs> you know, the, the box is 10 feet long, but the freaking yeah, TV the screen's is this big. big yeah. Totally. So that's what's going on. And I turn around to her and I go, one day I'm going to travel everywhere that Anthony traveled to. And she, you know what she tells me? She goes, you don't want to do that. It's dangerous out there. You, you know, you, you never know what people are going to do. You know, you're, you're better off if you don't. And bro, my grandma never even been on a fucking airplane. Right. Like, why would I listen to her? Why would I ever listen to her? And so one day I'm, I'm 30 and I'm like going through some stuff and I found this picture of her. And I remembered that day. And I was like, man, fuck this. I'm about to go travel. Cause I'd travel all over the States for years. I'd done the States yeah. thing. I've been everywhere. I mean, I moved to New York city when I was 18 years old. Like I'm, I've been everywhere. And so I found this picture. I remember that moment. The next day I started selling everything I owned on offer up and Facebook marketplace. And two months later, I bought a one-way ticket to Thailand and I spent over a year traveling the world. And uh, you'll get, so that's this how I became a minimalist. Cause I sold everything. See, that's, see, that's the, that's the thing. It's like, I just moved. Right. And I just looked at, while I was packing shit, I was like, yo, so much of this shit is garbage. Totally. Like, like, why am I just bringing this shit with me? Um, and the other thing, we bring our shit everywhere until you decide to stop bringing your shit everywhere. Oh man. It's the fucking truth, man. It, and it really is. It just, it just takes us a lot of things in life. I try to tell people is just solid decisions, you know, like just being like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to go for it. And it's very, it's almost a min, uh, minimalist like thought process as well. So like when I started doing like stand up, it was just like, yeah, like I'm gonna, just going to do stand up. Same. You know what I mean? And everyone was like, oh, like, you know, it's like, you think you could do that? I was like, I don't give a fuck if I could do it or not. I'm doing it. Yeah. Well, I, life, life is the answer to everything in life is action. Yeah. Everything in life. Like, people are like, I hate my relationship. I'm like, leave it or make it better. People are like, I hate my job. Leave it. People are like, I want to do this. I want to write a book. You know how many times a week I get an email from somebody and they're like, hey, can you help me figure out how to write a book? All the time. You know what my response is? Literally every verbatim, my response is sit the fuck down and write a book. Yeah. And that's the thing about all of this, the healing journey, the physical journey, the mental journey, the emotional journey, the spiritual journey. It's like, do it, do it. Nobody's coming, man. Nobody's coming. Nobody's going to come and knock on your door and be like, Hey, I heard you were having a bad day. I'd love to help you. 
No. It doesn't work that way. You've got to go and put yourself in the position. And look, honestly, man, like, and people hear me say this and they're like, oh yeah, you're belittling people or you're not really helping. How are you a trauma coach? And I go, well, let's just remember when I was 25 years old, the hardest thing that I did every single day was not kill myself. Yeah. Was to get up and brush my teeth. And so the, the truth is the actions are the thing that changed my life brush my teeth, quit smoking, leave the toxic relationship, start being honest in therapy, go get a coach, read the books, get educated, go to conferences, start making sure I put good food in my body, go to the doctor when I'm sick, go to the dentist when I need to, make sure that I show up day in and day out and tick the things off the checklist, not for the sake of ticking the things off the checklist, but because ticking the things off the checklist make my life better. Mm. And then it was about, okay, now how do you magnify that? How do you go deeper? How do you do more? How do you show up? And in the same way that it's like, do more, it's also like, but there's also days where doing nothing is doing more. And so it's all action. People will sit in bed. I heard Alex Hermosi say something fucking amazing. I wish I would have thought of it. I swear I kind of <laughs> just want to steal it. I do. I kind of want to just steal it from him and not yeah. tell him. He goes, most people spend four years to do something that takes one hour. Yeah. That's because they don't take action. And so in this healing journey and building self-love and learning all the tools, it's about action and implementing the thing that you learned today, today, not tomorrow, not three months from now. How did I write a book? How did I have a podcast? How have I spoken on these big stages? How do I blah, 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 blah. Dude, I just take action. Just do it. Just do it. And that's the key. That's the cornerstone to everything. And yes, it's scary. Yes, you're afraid. But fucking guess what? So is everybody else. Yeah. And, and everybody's way, afraid. On the Everyone's other side afraid. of my office, there's a whiteboard. And the whiteboard in the middle is a giant square. And in the middle of that giant square, I wrote, close the gap. Okay. Where you are today versus who you want to be tomorrow, there is a gap. And every single day, the mission is close that gap until you become that version of you. And then when you become that version of you, there will be another gap. It's like Michael 2.0. Right? Yeah. And, and that's the thing. The only way you get there, people are like, oh, I'm going to go to the conference. Do you know how many people go to a conference and do nothing with it? Oh, I'm sure. 96% of them. And that's and when, they're and there and that's when they year, said, oh, yeah, year. that was, and those are the people that will be, oh, this is a waste of money. Like, oh, this, that, and that. it's like, no, yeah. you didn't buy into the program. Yeah. It's not even just that, but you just didn't do anything. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't it, do you know, anything. Do you, do you have moments where almost like you'll be working with a client and you'll be like, you're not, you're not uh, committed enough. I don't even want to do this. If I have to. Yeah. But look, here's, what's really interesting when, because I only work with a handful of people one-on-one, -on -one, we really right. spend more time on group stuff just because of time. Yeah, for sure. Um, but if I'm working with somebody one-on-one -on -one and they've paid me multiple five figures to come and go through this process with me and they're not showing up, I'll be like, dude, I'm about to just fire you because you have to be able to prove to me that you want to be here. Mm. I'm not trying to prove me to you. Because I'm already good. Right. And so when, the, when that moment happens, which for some people it does, it's a very small percentage of people. Because like even to get to that moment with me, dude, you have to go through a trial by fire. I need to know that you're serious about this. Right. Even, even to get on the pre-call before you even touch me is a 45-minute form. You know how I know it's 45 minutes? Because I wrote the damn thing. Right. And so that's where it starts. Like how committed are you? So the, it's a very, 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 very small percentage of people that I will ever have that conversation with. But when it comes to that conversation, I simply ask them a question. What do you want? What do you want? Because you can have anything that you want in your life. And then I'll say, what are you willing to do to get there? Because I'll tell you right now, if the answer is anything less than no excuses, it ain't going to work. And you're wasting my time and taking away from someone who is begging to be here because the wait list is hundreds of people long. And in those moments, it's about, I'm not an asshole about it because I get it, man. Do, do, people it think, do people think you're an asshole? I don't know. I never ask them, but I'm just saying I'm not an asshole about it. I just go, Hey, look, I get it. I understand where it's at in life to feel like what's the point, but you got to decide. 
you have to be the one to choose this because if you're not willing to, I cannot assist you because I'm not going to save your life. Mm. I'm not going to be able to be there for you other than this 36 minutes we're together every week, then the programs, then the courses, then the podcast. When it comes to your life, you have to be the one to take action. And if you're looking for a scapegoat, if you're just here because you're like, oh, I tried it and it didn't work, I'm going to figure that out before we even get down to our first conversation. Mm. Right. And so the moments in which people have uh, that I have found that my clients are not committing, they're not showing up is because they don't believe that they're worthy of having the life on the other side of that gap. And so my job is to help make sure we close that gap. And again, this starts by taking action. We look at their life and say, where are you? Where do you want to be? What do you want? And I look for the clues. I look for the hints. I look for the subtleties in the conversation, the nuance about who they really are. And I drill into it. One of the guys I was working with recently, you know, he was massively, I won't say massively, he was overweight, probably about 40 pounds. And he was like, dude, I used to be in such great shape. And I rolled jujitsu three times a week and I was running all the time. And my wife was in shape and blah, blah, blah. And I go, well, sounds to me like you need to go sign up for jujitsu. And, and he was like, yeah, I'll, yeah, yeah, you're right. I'll probably do that. And I was like, no, 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 you misunderstood. I meant right now. Yeah. And I literally on, on our coaching session, I said, take out your fucking phone. You're calling the gym. You're calling the studio. You're going to make sure that you can get in within the next 24 hours. And the next day at 10 AM, he was in because if you want to build confidence and you want to close that gap, you have to take action. And so when it comes to not being committed, it's because you're missing something. There's a piece of the puzzle on the table that you're afraid to have because his mindset was, well, I used to be in shape. I'll never be able to do it again. And my mindset is always, well, where's the solution? Mm. No, it's the truth. I mean, I I just lost 45 pounds on making a decision like that myself. It's one of those things where it's like, dude, you either got want to lose the weight or you don't. You know, because it, it, it's easy to be like, oh, you know, like uh, I could do that. You know, I could figure this out. It's like, bro, don't wait till Monday. Like, you know, I, I've met, I meet a lot of people that are like, you know what? Like starting Monday, like I'm going to do like this diet. I'm like, dude, just start that shit right now. Yeah. Like, why, well, are, we, why, are, we, why are we waiting till Monday? I will say this. It's contextual, right? Because sometimes you need to get out whatever that thing is, right? Because for some people, it's like, man, I just need that chocolate cake one more time. I'm that guy. Right. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. When it, when it comes to diets, I'm like, Monday for sure. But when I say Monday, I mean Monday. I don't negotiate about Monday. Yeah, see, when I say Saturday, Monday, I don't mean, Yeah. But on Saturday, I mean, bro. I mean chocolate, I chocolate Sunday. Cake. Yeah, yeah, totally. 100%. But on Monday, it's gone. And until I hit the goal, because, you know, I was 351 pounds. That's and, wild. And I'm... 218 today, right? Been as low as 205 within the last seven years since I was like, got really, really serious about my health. And the thing is like, it, it's in that decision of recognizing you have to play a mind game with yourself and you mm. cannot negotiate with yourself. And so if you're going to say Monday, then it needs to be Monday. But if it's going to be today, it needs to be today. And that's the thing that you got to figure out because everybody operates differently for some things for me, it is today, but for some things it is Monday and you just got to figure that out about yourself because not everybody's fucking David Goggins, man. Yeah, I know that guy's just too much. I see all that guy like running and fucking like hail and shit. I'm just like, yo, dude, I'm like, not everybody's David Goggins. (laughs) That guy scares the fucking shit out of me. Um, So I want to ask you black people in mental health. What can we do as outsiders to help with those situations? And then also, and also where do you see, you know, you know, inner city communities, let's just talk, let's just be honest, the hood, uh, you know, where, where, where it's hard for them to get these resources, or maybe it's hard for them to reach a person like you, what do they do? Yeah. Well, look, I'm not a black person, so I cannot speak to that. Um, I'm biracial. And so I will speak from that narrative. And having lived on both sides of it, right? And being a poor mixed kid living with a white family in the hood is a really interesting thing. And what I what I'll say about it is this: regardless, this is what people don't understand. It's not about the minority is not the race. The minority is the wealth. 
Yeah. And so you'll see in these communities, this is where it's really twisted in America. And I don't think most people understand this. And especially as the, the wage gap closes, one of the things that ha is happening is there is no longer a middle class. There oh, is the yeah, upper no. class and there is the lower class, period. That's just the nature of what's happening. And so unless you're making, I, I think the latest number was like $425,000 a year, um, you're basically in what you could call middle class, but that's not true because I know people who make 150 grand in New York city who are barely surviving. Right? Oh yeah. I tell people that all the time. If yeah. you want to live in New York city, you got to make six figures to be broke. Totally. hundred percent. If you're lucky. And so the thing is that you really have to focus on when it comes to mental health in impoverished communities is recognizing that resources are not readily available to them because society has built it to be so. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I promise you, if you go wait in line in the WIC office and the food stamp office and the HUD home office, everybody looks the same, mm -hmm. right? And that look is not of color. That look is of despair, of desperation, of fear, of a lack of education, of ignorance, of growing up in a world where creativity is stuffed down and critical thinking is taken away from you the moment that you're born, and, and so the thing that I think about quite frequently is that I, I love the what is happening with technology. Mm -hmm. I love, 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 love what is happening with technology because I can release a podcast and 10,000 people can hear it. And I can post something on the internet and 40,000 people can see it. I mean, just from Think Unbroken Metrics, we'll have over 450,000 impressions of our content in the month of October, love right? It. That's a lot of people seeing mm -hmm. it. And if they see it once, great. But what happens when they start to see it twice, three times, four times, seven times, 25 times to get indoctrinated into this, this different world, this different reality. And so what I think about is like, yes, of course, it'd be really easy to point the finger at the government and say, the government's not giving everybody the thing that they need. They never have. That's not their job. And it never has been. And it never will be a Actually, if you live in this country, we don't live in Sweden, we don't live in Finland. So you have to face reality. Most people are unwilling to acknowledge truth. And instead, they want to place blame and go, oh, it's their fault. No, reality is this. You actually do live in the greatest country on freaking planet Earth if you can figure out how to play the game. Oh, yeah. And so what happens is when it comes to mental health, you have to recognize and understand that it is in your power and you must invoke your own right to take advantage of the information that is here. And if you are unwilling to do that because you're expecting somebody to knock on the door, then you're in trouble. And that's what most people in impoverished communities do, because we grow up being told, make sure that you stay on the dole, make sure you stay on the wick, on the food stamp. You know, and I remember distinctly seeing friends who I would be like, because I didn't graduate high school, right? Literally my senior year of high school, I don't graduate. My teacher, my business teacher fails me. I have to go to summer school. In summer school, the teacher tells me, hey, we're just going to give you the diploma. We're done with you. So oh, yeah, I no, that's... actually have the education, right? And that's so the same happened, thing that happened to me. Yeah. Well, same it happens happened all to the me. time. They were like, dude, we just get the fuck out of here. Yeah, that's what it was. And then so I'm sitting here, I'm uneducated, I'm ignorant with a high school diploma that has no merit because I don't know how to do anything. Literally, I don't I know how to sell drugs and run from the cops. And so I'm like, fuck, man, what do I do? And so it was looking at this thing where I was faced with the decision that I had to make to educate myself, to get skill, because again, skill has utility. And so that's the same thing that applies to minority communities. But you have to pull yourself out of the crab barrel mentality, because mm -hmm. as I started going up in my own personal development and growth, people kept trying to pull me down. Why would you want to go do that? Don't you want the government to pay for that? Don't you want the community to do that? Don't you want? And I was like, no, I want to do it. And that's what happens with mental health. You have to be willing to want it. I mean, there's a whole conversation we don't have enough time to get into, but the, the truth of the reality is that you have to be the arbiter of your own future. And most people are not, and they want to point the finger and go, it's your fault. No, it's actually your fault because if you can go, I know, dude, I literally have friends who went from homeless to having PhDs. Don't tell me it's not possible. And this is the one caveat. This is the one little thing I hope people will take from this if they've made it this far with us. 
is that if somebody else can do it, you can do it too. That's how I've modeled my whole life. That's it. That's the secret. That's the key. I just go, did somebody do it? Perfect. How do I do what they did? And so if you're in this place in your life, where you're like, my mental health is struggling. Well, guess what? Mine was too. When I was dirt poor, 50 grand in debt, coming from homelessness, coming from abuse, from in, coming from money trauma, coming from the whole thing. And now it's like, I look at my life. Tom Bilyeu is one of my coaches and one of my mentors and a great friend to me. I have people like Grant Cardone, who has invested into my company, who is a partner. I've spent time with Tony Robbins, right? But it all started where I was. It started with buying a course. That's it. And even really, truthfully, it started before that because I was listening to audio shows and I was watching Shark Tank and I was like watching Marcus Limonis on The Prophet. And I was like starting to bring all this stuff into my brain. And it's like, you have to change your environment. You have to change your friends. Like, uh, dude, I'm, I've, I left Indiana at such a young age with no money just to go for it because yeah. I was like, fuck it. And that's the thing that you have to do. You have, you have to let go of all the things that hold you back and just say, I'm going to fix my mental health by any means necessary. And so if that means I have to pack up everything I own into the back of the Toyota Camry, drive across the damn country and go to a therapist with what little bit of money that I have, then motherfucker, let's ride. Love it. I love it. I, I it's, it's, Oh man, it, it, it's, it's, I exhale like that because it really is, it, it really comes down to a decision. Like I'm going to do this or not, you know? And, and that's, that's a, that's a crossroads. A lot of people are afraid to get to. So they almost like, you know, they, 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 they dance around it and they avoid getting to that point where they actually have to make a decision, you know, and, and, and it's tough on people. Do you ever take a day off? Yeah. I took yesterday off, played video oh. games all day long. I great. love it. What are, what are you playing right now? I was playing the Spider-Man game. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So yeah. once every once every about two months, it just hits me, and it might be in the middle of the day on a Wednesday afternoon. I'm like, Shh, nope, done. Honor, honor your truth. I never push myself more than I need to. No, because one that doesn't help your mental health, and also it's just gonna run. You're gonna run yourself into the ground at that point. But yeah, uh, the Miles Morales one. Yeah, that one. Yeah, that game's fucking awesome. Um. And then my last question that I ask everybody, simple question, is are you happy today? Dude, happiness is fleeting. Elaborate. Happiness, like every, it's like asking, are you mad today? Right? It's always, fleeting. The, the emotion comes yeah. and goes. We, we, we get caught up in trying to be this or that. And I'm like, dude, today I've been happy. I've been sad. I've been angry. I've been joyful. I've been full of glee. I've been full of like spite, you know, because it, it comes and goes. And that's where I'm at. And the, the thing that I always try to think of is, when it comes to emotions is, am I controlling them? Mm. And that's the way I operate in the world. Am I, am I at level every single moment of every single day as much as humanly possible? I got 52 people who work for me. I'm on podcasts all the time. I got to consult companies, a blah, blah. The list goes on. There's always, I'm going to pick up my phone. It's been one hour. I'm going to have 13 texts to reply to. 12 of them are going to be bad news. And I need to make sure that I can operate and control my emotions in a way that I can still execute the game plan and not get caught up in happiness or sadness or anything in between, but recognize mm. that I can be both at all times. Damn, dude. Those are bars. You you are an intense man. I will I will give you that. I will give you that. Uh, and I would also say that uh, where can everybody find you? Where can everybody find your classes, your book? Where can everybody find you? Where's the central hub? Yep. Um, I'm everywhere on social at Michael Unbroken. And the best thing to do is go to thinkunbrokenacademy.com. We have a group of thousands of trauma warriors from around the world. It's absolutely free to come and hang out. Um, it's just thinkunbrokenacademy.com. You'll find the podcast, the books, the courses, everything there. All right, guys, listen, I've been joined by, I mean, this dude's an inspiration. Uh, my, Michael Unbroken, uh, he is an absolute 100% savage. Uh, and I really appreciate you coming out here, telling parts of your truth, telling parts of how you think uh, the world is. And honestly, a lot of it I agree with. So um, listen, you got a fan in me today. And um, thank you so much for taking the time. Really appreciate it. And best of luck in the future, my man. For sure, my guy. I appreciate you. Take care.